Hi, there you are. I'm here. Okay. Too. Good. I wasn't seeing you for a second. Oh, oh, um, oh. How you doing, Dee Dee? Good. How are you guys? You can see <laughs> them waving to you behind me here. Um, I'm just going to turn down the lights because with this, um, we've got the lights up and there's a glare, so we can't really see you very well up on the big screen. Okay. Um, <laughs> But if you want to just start out and, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in e-publishing and everything and as a writer and then um, give us some tips and we'll open it up for Q&A afterwards, that would be great. Okay. That's okay. fine. Dee Dee. Well, good evening, y'all. I'm Dee Dee Scott. And first, thank you all so much for having me. And I hear congratulations to all of you NaNoWriMo peeps. So all of you guys are NaNoWriMo people, right? Yep. Very cool. And you all made your goal? Yeah. <laughs> very cool. If you didn't, hey, you tried. So that's the important thing, right? Mm -hmm. So very good. Okay, well, uh, let's see a little bit about me. Um, I have been writing for publication, if you will, uh, for 13 plus years, believe it or not. So I started a long time ago. I don't know, and we'll talk. I want to get to know each of you a little bit too. But so 13 years ago, I started out on this path, and um, you know, at that point, there wasn't any such thing as indie e publishing. So what we did at that point was the trade pub route or traditional publishing, and the big six, which are probably soon going to end up being the big three, or maybe two, or maybe one. Um, and you guys probably maybe have been that route, and, and it'll help me a little bit. How many years have you guys written? Each of you. How, are there four of you in the room? Yeah. Okay, I'm a cool. husband. I don't count. What is it? I'm a husband, so I don't hey, count. Hey, husbands are very important. <laughs> My sport. husband is sitting here, too, and I'm telling you, it's a special brand of crazy y'all put up with, so thank you. <laughs> He counts. I bounced ideas off him, and he's helped me, you know, make some murder plots, and he counts. Hey, and isn't that great when you're in a restaurant and you're like, so what would happen if the head was like, you know, in the? Have you ever noticed that? And then people turn around and look at you like, what in the hell? And I, I have a little potty mouth, so if that bothers you, <laughs> tell me it to put a stick in it, and I'll try to behave. But how about the rest of you? How long have you been writing? Uh, about five or six years. Good. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and what genres? What? What genres do you write? Um, usually whatever comes into my head. My first novels were fantasy, but this one, I, this time, I did a mystery. Cool. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about indie publishing that we can talk about too is that you know the sky's the limit as far as genre. And like in the tradie pub world, they tend to want to pigeonhole you, you know, in one genre and really make a brand for you there. But kind of anything goes in the indie world, so it's really, really refreshing as a writer. Okay, who's next? So tell me a little bit about what you write and how long you've written. I haven't written anything. I, have, I said I haven't written anything. Okay. I've just been toying with the idea. Of okay. Hey. I take it as much. And that's fine. We got to start somewhere. And who else? Let's see, do we have one more? Yeah. I actually ended up writing a, um, I was confused about what genre it was, really. <laughs> I was like, where do I fit in? Because it's um, it's a romance, but it's also a murder mystery suspense. So cool. there's like a couple of subplots going on, and it's really about a serial killer, but the main heroine actually helps solve the mystery puzzle, but it's also a romance, too. So I guess it would be romantic suspense. Very it, cool. It sounds like a very standard romantic cozy mystery. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> what was that? It was cut out. Feel kill you thrown in for good measure. Yeah. There. <laughs> okay. Well, kind of like all of you, when I first started out, I really wasn't sure kind of what hole I fit in either, if you will. So I just kind of started writing whatever really kind of what I like to say made my muses tick or made my muses dance like nobody was watching. One of the first nonfiction books I did was Muse Therapy. And uh, it is. It's a it's a writer's way to rein in all your creative divas and dans, I call them, and get those thoughts on the page. So that'll be a good one for you to check out. Um, and I then my new one is 10 Years and 24 Hours to Indie Publishing Success. And that's where I really talk about the path, and we can talk about that or whatever you guys want tonight on, you know, what it took for me to make it. And, and to give you a little idea, um, two years ago, it was August 2010, 
when I first decided after 13 years of pursuing that Trady Pub path, and, and I got a top agent, an agent who was in the top 20 of best-selling agents, did that for three years and still nothing. And, uh, you know, I just got to the point, I don't know if any of you read Joe Conrath's blog, and it's a wonderful blog to read, The Newbie's Guide to Publishing, joeconrath.blogspot.com, I believe, and you'll see the link on my website as well. Um, but I had heard him speak a couple times, and he had tremendous success and was a traditionally published author as well. And, you know, it, he just, he just kept spinning his wheels and he never could get that promotion he wanted. He never, um, he just never got the backing he really wanted. And, uh, he finally convinced me that it was time to just try it, you know, and even my agent told me, and I've long since fired her and that's another story in and of itself, but <laughs> she did tell me one smart thing. And that was, you know, you've got this great platform, but you got to have a product in order to keep all those readers, you got to have a book out there. And so that finally really sunk into me. So in August of 2010, I talked to my fabulous husband and we just decided, you know, what the hell, we're going to go for it. And I NDE published my first book then, the Boot Scootin' books. And the very first one was Boot Scootin' Blondie, because I like to say it's chick lit gone country. It's sex in the city meets urban cowboy. <laughs> and uh, I published that and now little over two and a half years later, 200,000 downloads of that one title alone. I now have 28 books that are all NDE published, and I've now sold over 100,000 books. And gone from my first month in August of 2010 with 27 books sold, and I was flying high, man, and thought that was fantastic, as it was. After 13 years, 27 in one month, I'd hit gold, baby. And uh, now here we are two and a half years later, and I'm an Amazon top 100 author, Barnes and Noble's top 100, and that means with all of their published books. So it doesn't matter if you're James Patterson, Daniel Steele, um, you know, uh, let's see, what are some other, Janet Avodovich, Dee Dee Scott's right there with you in those rankings. So top 100, and Amazon top 100, and Barnes and Noble's the number one self-published book on Barnes and Nobles last year at this time with my first box set. Another fabulous thing you can do in the indie world is you can put all your files together into a box set. And boy, to the fans like that, it's a one-click buy for, you know, five or six books and a great price. Um, so, yes, and now Movers and Shakers. I just made the Amazon Movers and Shakers list again this week. Total surprise. I don't know why the book just took off, and you love that when that happens. So one of my new series, the Stuck with a series, they're Stuck with a Schmuck, Stuck with a Stiff, Stuck with a Spell, and now Stuck with Sleigh Bells. And they're humorous mysteries with a little paranormal twist. And um, now they're on the movers and shakers list. And, and the movers and shakers, when you're new to the business and you might not know what that means, that's selling about three to 500 copies of just that one book a day. That's the rate that that sells at that point. And um, it's, it's just been an amazing journey. I wish, I wish 13 years ago, you know, hindsight's always a genius, right? But I wish that this opportunity would have been there 13 years ago. I never would have wasted my time going the traditional published route. And I think the other thing for me is I have a very unique perspective because I come from working for one of the big six pubs in their return center. And once you understand what it means for authors, every author that's traditionally published to have that reserve on returns, if you had heard that term in the publishing world, if you're traditionally published, when you or before you can ever make a dime of royalties from that publisher, they have what they call a reserve on returns. And what that means is they hold back any royalties due you based on what percentage of the books that they print and send to stores they think are going to come back. Because in a bookstore, a brick and mortar store like your local Barnes and Nobles or an independent shop too, they can take those books with a hundred percent return capability. So that they could keep your book, your paper copy book, on a shelf for up to, uh, you know, whatever the terms of their contract are. Maybe three months is usually the typical because they want room for the new stuff coming in. Then they can return it and they get full credit. 
So what happens is, is they hold all your money back until you meet that reserve on return. But the way that those returns are calculated is pretty terrifying. It's a bunch of people standing by a conveyor belt and just tossing books onto there, deciding if they're going to be shredded and turned into toilet paper, which is what happens to them. And they make more money on the toilet paper than they do sending the books back to the stores. And that's the truth. Or they just decide to save them and send them back somewhere else. So those are some pretty scary things when you look on the business end for the tradey side that really convinced me to give indie publishing a shot. Because for the most part, Amazon does allow you to return an ebook, but it's very rare. And, uh, you know, it's nothing that you're held back on royalties from. So that's kind of a little bit about me and how I got started, why I made the decision to indie e-publish. And um, what kinds of questions do you have so I kind of know how to gear tonight's presentation? And ask me anything. I'll pretty much say anything. And if I don't know, I'll make something up. Even better. <laughs> I actually had this conversation on another forum. Um, Charlene Harris is sure. that I read quite a bit, and I'm on uh -huh. her forum. And I talked a little bit about the pros and cons of traditional publishing sure. versus Versus, you know, this type of publishing and her take on the whole thing. She's always been traditionally published. Right. Um, she's never had to write a, even a query letter, mm -hmm. and she's, you know, had this success. It took her 26 years, she said, though, right, to get yeah, published. Yeah, she's an overnight 26 years success. I'm the 13. Yeah. yeah. 26 years. But what her philosophy is is that she didn't feel that e-publishing would make an author enough money to sustain them. Right. And that was a concern that a lot of people had. And then I had another person chip in and said that that. It's changing in the climate of all the Kindles and all the Nooks and all the technology that they think that it's changing. Well, what is your perception of that? Well, I'll tell you, and I'll be very point blank with you. Um, my first year in NDE publishing, 2010, and I published in August, as I said, by December, that year I made $300. 2011, I made almost $3,000. This year, it's going to be close to 100000 Wow. So that's pretty sustainable, right? I and so. I've done all of that on my own. And I'm not the only one that's made it. I mean, I'm kind of a, a medium fry, if you will. I, I, I'm kind of on the high end of the mid list, approaching kind of, you know, the big guns area. And, um, and I'll give you an example. Amazon now does author rankings besides book rankings. They just started it, in fact, two days ago. And... Um, in all the authors on Amazon, which would be everybody from Charlene Harris to, you know, Debbie Maycomer to Patterson to, you know, Rowling to you name it, I'm ranked between number 721 and 2,100 in overall books sold in, in money, money made and number of books sold. So, you know, that's not bad. And I've totally done that all on my own. I'll tell you what you want to do to give you a, a good rounded perspective is my website, the WG2E, I don't know if any of you have been on there yet, it's the writer's guide to ePublishing.com. And you can find all of this on my website, um, which is ddscottville.blogspot.com. You can find it on my Facebook, Twitter, you know, so all the links are there for you too if you don't write them down tonight. But you'll see we get 3,000 unique visits a day on that site, a million hits a month. And it's predominantly all in the e-published authors who are doing the same things that I'm doing and having tremendous success. Um, Bob Mayer, you may have seen him at several different conferences, huge. Um, he's been on the Sci-Fi Channel, Discovery Channel, New York Times bestseller. He's totally indie publishing now. Um, you know, and he's making six and seven, or I'm sorry, seven figures a year. So, you know, there's a lot of money to be made, but it's a lot of work too. So a lot of it, you have to balance, you know, I do this full time now. So I am writing or at the computer, connecting with readers, connecting with fellow writers, you know, pretty much seven days a week. But I love that. That's my passion. So... For me, that's worth it. I think the big, huge misconception for upcoming writers is that there's still that perception that there's this silver or this gold 
lining and cloud to have a traditional big publisher behind you. But they don't have great marketing plans anymore. I mean, it's very rare if you get a big push from a publisher anymore. If you're not one of the big ones, you get hardly nothing. And the people that have been there will tell you. You know, to, to look at a career like Charlene's or, you know, Ivanovich or Nora Roberts isn't really a good comparison to start with. They're all very motivational. And I've heard them all speak and met them all personally. But that's a different league. The person just starting out isn't going to get that kind of backing. And if you want that equal footing and you want that chance to really get out there, and I'll tell you what, the tradey pubs now are looking at the successful indies. That's who they pick up. So that slush pile that used to be all of us in there, now they're pretty much skipping it. If you don't have an indie record to back you up, they won't even look at you nine times out of ten because they want to see that you already have a good sales record. So it depends on what you want and, uh, you know, kind of what your philosophy is. But don't kid yourself into thinking that all oh, if you go the tradey pub route, then all you have to do is just write because that's not the way it is. You're still going to do all of your marketing, even if you have a big house behind you, because they're not going to do it. What kind of marketing did you do when you first started out? Um, you know, the, the, the thing that I've learned, and I talk a lot about it in my book, The 10 Years and 24 Hours, is you want to connect with readers. Gosh, I wish I knew that two and a half years ago. You know, I love hanging with writers. I have one of the biggest websites for indie writers out there right now. But where I've made my money and where I've made my loyalties and following is in my readers. And think about it. That's your customer. The majority of your time should be with readers, not fellow writers. Not that I don't love hanging with y'all, but it's readers that you want to be out talking to. And you know the easiest way to do it is just start hanging where they hang. They're on Facebook. They're on Twitter. They're on Goodreads. They're on Pinterest. Oh, my gosh, I've never built an audience so fast as I have on Pinterest. And talk about a writer's dream. I do a lot of collaging, and I used to, you know, have a high on Gorilla Glue every week. But now, you know, you can just skip the Gorilla Glue, man, which is much healthier, and go right to Pinterest. <laughs> And then everybody can get involved. They're sending you pictures for your next castle and your next book. And they're sending you, oh, this would be a great car for Grahams. Or this would be one of my favorite, their favorite characters. I call them the blue-haired Charlie's Angels. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, they're all, I mean, they pick out pictures for me and put them up there. So you hang where the readers hang. That's the best thing that you can do. And that's free on social media, right? So you're not paying for fancy postcard, you're not paying for fancy bookmarks, which, you know, if you're ebook publishing, who wants a bookmark anyway, right? What are you going to do with it? So you don't, you're not wasting your time on stuff like that. You're, you're making a nice website. You can do it yourself. I'm a techno dunce. I mean, ask Leah, the poor girl. I had to figure out how to even get the Skype to work. But <laughs> so, you know, it's, and so it's not doing all the fancy high tech stuff. Get a great website that you can do yourself for free with Blogspot or WordPress. Both are so easy to use. Start getting your names out there. I have another website, the RG2E, which is a sister site to the WG2E, and it's the Reader's Guide to e-publishing. It's totally for readers, and I have over a thousand people that come there every day. And what I do, and once you guys get your books published, you're welcome to come there too. It's free. And every day we have a different author and a different genre and a different book up there. And the only catch is that you ebook gift, which is such a cool thing to do. You ebook gift the people who request one that day. And you can do as many or as few as you want, whatever you can afford. And what a way to get readers to, you know, really get into your books is say the first one is on me. That's the one approach I've used that I think above all else for marketing has made me what I am. And that's the first one is on me. And what I mean by that is my debut book, that Boot Scoot and Blanique, is now free on all platforms. That's why it has over 200,000 downloads. So it's free. The first one's on me. And I say that to everyone, and they take advantage of it. And that, there's no better way to convince them. And then the next thing you do is 
I believe, and one of the things you'll see all over my websites, is nothing beats treating readers to great books for great prices. Great books for great prices. The rest of my books are between 99 cents and 2.99. Which means in the indie pub world, I make between $0.35 cents and $2 a book. That, believe it or not, is a lot more than you make in the tradey pub world. You're going to make, now listen to this, you're, you're, so a tradey pub book in print is going to cost, what, about $7.99 and up? Yeah. At a $7.99, the author in the tradey pub world, by the time the agent gets paid and the publisher, is going to make between $0.14 and $0.22 cents a book. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. Wow, right? The drum wow. roll here. So yeah, so you have this seven ninety nine book. And seriously, who's buying paper right now? Not many people. Not when they can one click buy from their pajamas at home on the couch with their glass of wine, right? And not have to spend the gas money to go thirty miles round trip to the nearest store. So there's the there's the money on the Trady Pub. So to make $0.35 cents to $2 a book is really good. And that's what I make across all platforms. $0.99 cent books, you only get a 30% royalty. But in the tradey pub world, you get 7 to 14%. On a $2.99 and above book in the indie EPUB world, you make 70 to 80%. And you never go above seven to fourteen in the tradey pub. So there's a big difference. There's a lot to consider. It just That's takes right. time to build your audience, but it's well worth it. I had one thought about marketing, and I don't know if I bounced it off my husband, of course, and he he kind of had some ideas one way, but the person I'm creating is obviously a fictional character, but I wanted to do a series with her. Sure. So I thought series work, it, by the way, that's a great thing to do. Go ahead. Wouldn't it be interesting to create a Facebook as the character? Uh huh. Answer questions in the character mode. If I put a disclaimer on there saying I'm the character, I'm not a real person. This is the character from this book. Would that be? something that you would think was doable. I think it's very doable and a lot of people do do it, but, and I'll play devil's advocate, not because I think it's not a great idea, it's just a lot of extra work for you. What you yeah. wanna do in today's world because of social media is you wanna brand yourself. Okay. You have this sparkling personality. I mean, I haven't met any of you tonight and I can already tell you any of you put books up and I'll get them just because I'm getting a kick out of talking with you because I've bonded with you as a person. Okay. And with social media, we have so many cool ways for free to get to know each other. Yes, you can maybe do a post on your blog from your character's point of view, but let your blog and your brand be about you. And the other thing that that does is like, and, I, and I'm terrible with names, I will never forget your faces. If I see you 30 years from now, I'll know exactly where I met you, um, but I'll, I won't know your name. So, so don't take that personal. But like this gentleman here who said he's writing in different genres as well, by branding yourself, it doesn't matter what genre you write. You can have this huge collection of cool stuff because people are going to know you as you. Okay, so you, and it's, so you want to do concentrated focus branding and you want to brand yourself. And then maybe a little bit about your series too. So it's fun to have a little something kooky and quirky going on with each series. And that's why I would say, yeah, if you have this great character that's larger in life, like my Grams, she does some of my book descriptions if she's in the book because she's just so hilarious. People would rather hear her tell what the book's about than me. So that's kind of where I use grams. If you look on my um, my latest release, Stuck with Sleigh Bells, you'll say, and here it is straight from grams, because grams is going to be Santa this year, because Santa's had a double knee replacement, and grams is in charge of the big red ride. So, you know, who else better to tell about the book than grams, who, my God, we better all drink eggnog early, because grams is going on the sleigh. So those are the kind of the fun ways you can use your character. And if you really wanted to do that, you'd be better off creating a Twitter account anyway, because I've seen a lot of people who do that. I have a couple of people who are following me, actually, who are fictional characters. They're <laughs> following me on Twitter. Yeah. And 
And but and I know that Facebook cracked down in a big way a couple of years ago on fictional character profiles. Mm -hmm. So and I, I don't know. MySpace doesn't do that anymore. I think you had to use them as pages, more. right? You had to put them on the yeah. page instead of the individual. <laughs> page for that that character but you need the fan base first and right man yeah it's, so just, it's basically doing double work and you can let that character work for you but still be you right and that way you don't run the risk people know the character but they can't remember who the hell wrote it so then how are they going to find your book you know what i'm saying can you talk a little bit about the actual like process of getting your ebook up for sale and the, from these sure. different events. That'd be great. Sure. What I, well, as you know by now, I'm a techno idiot. So I don't do any of the techno stuff myself as far as the formatting, the cover design. And I will encourage all of you um, to use a freelance editor as well. And not because you might not be great at grammar or whatever, but it's, you know, it's just really good to have another person outside to have a look at it with fresh eyes that you know you, you know you're the writer so you're like me you've read the darn thing so many times and so many times in the same chapter that you're not even really reading it when you're looking at it it's like did I just read that page I have no clue because I'm already thinking about something else so the editing I have I have a whole team I like to call them a Dee, Dee Scottville team that produces my book so I write it and then what happens is I send it to my editor. My editor does two passes. And that's the other thing about the WG2E. You'll see a list of all kinds of examples. All of us talk about who we use, give you the link so that you know exactly how to contact these people. Feel free to say Dee Dee sent you. I get tons of emails from that. And, you know, they're appreciative of all the work they can get. So get yourself an editor. Get a fresh set of eyes on that. And that's different than a beta reader, too. Beta readers are great, and you can use those, too. Do you all know the difference between the betas? I've been using, like, auto print. Is that, like, a beta? It's an algorithm. Yeah, you can use it in a program base, or you can do it with real people. Some people like <laughs> teachers to do it or friends. There's also a program on the Internet that I found through Write or Die called Edit Minion. Yep. I think, it's, I think that's what it's called. And it, it just picks out, like, different... Um, just Reader grammatical errors, or, grammatical errors. Right. Yeah. and there's another thing on there that checks for cliches and stuff. Yeah. Just, used words. Yeah. Yeah. And also, what I do to tell overused words is I make a wordle out of my document, so I know that yeah. I, if, I, if I'm using the word replied too many times. Yeah, those are to. those are all great things to look for yeah. and catch. And <laughs> it's, it's still really cool to work with a freelance editor too. So so use your programs that you're using and then pass it on to, you know, like your freelance editor or whoever you're going to use. Following the editing process, it goes to, well, in the meantime, while all the editing's going on, I've already given ideas to my cover designer. And then she will, you know, make those books come to life. And then um, I send the final document and the cover to my format people at 52 Novels. And um, they do everybody from Barry Eisler to Ruth and Michael Harris, uh, all New York Times bestsellers, and um, just a wonderful service. Um, the Cider family, it's family run, they're super nice, have a lot of great designers. And they're the ones that make my books look so clean um, when, you're, when you pull them up on your e-reader. And that's so important because the worst thing you can do is have this great story, but it's just a pain in the ass to read because there's the words are all over it's not you know here's one paragraph the other one is set over here and plus you want to spend your time writing right not fiddling around with the formatting and the covers and the your bread and butter is in your words that's where your strength is so outsource and let the other people do the rest i can tell you that each book cost me about five hundred dollars and that's by the time i have the cover and the editing and the formatting. So yeah, it's a little investment, but I make that back in less than a month. And the and the more books you have out, the faster it's called earn out, the faster you'll earn out. So it sounds like an investment up front and by all means, if you know people or you can get it done for cheaper than that, have at it. Um, but those are all pretty standard. A cover is going to cost you anywhere from $100 to $500, depending on who you have do it. 
I pay a hundred for mine. I use Laura Morgan. She's amazing. L a u r a and then M o r r i g a n, and you can find her website. Um, just fabulous. Does amazing covers. Around a hundred dollars. Um, my editing is around 197 a book. So roughly, or I'm sorry, that's for my formatting. My formatting is around 197 to 200 a book. I have 52 novels, and I have um, my new editor, uh, Megan Ward, is um, just starting to work with her out of San Francisco, and she's going to be a little more expensive, around 1,100 a book. Um, but I'm just trying something new. Uh, with her to see, you know, it's kind of good for a writer every once in a while to kind of branch out and get a different perspective on their work. So I'm going to try that. I also have used the Edit Dude, a wonderful uh, editor as well. But they're both really busy, so you'll want to get your, uh, you know, get your projects in and see if they have time. One of our sponsors is Create Create Space. Yes, they've offered. Um, you know, five free books for us to print. Sure. And you can create your own cover on there. But they're um, an e-publisher, too. Well, Space okay. is owned by Amazon. Okay. I don't know if you knew that or not, but that's an Amazon company. That's their print book division. So can you tell us a little bit about them? Sure. Do you um, I don't do mine in print right now, and I'll tell you why. Because you have to have different formatting than you do for the ebook, you have to have different covers because remember on the print, you've got the front, the spine, and the back. Mm -hmm. On an ebook, you've just got the front. And so the whole cycle, it's like you'd be paying twice for the book. And you really, when you're on Amazon, people are really looking for Kindle books. And yes, they still buy paper too. But if you read through some of the posts on the WG2E, most of the authors I know who have invested, because CreateSpace isn't free, and if you're going to take your books to a conference or a library or whatever, you still have to buy them to go sell them, right? If you're an e-author, you just take the links where they can download them. It's free. You get five free copies after you purchase, like, um, an advanced reader copy that you have to edit or something. Right. There, there's there's a, a process through it. It's free. Like the actual copies like you get are months, free yeah, right. for, for X number of months. Right. But then it's what, $30 or something, a setup fee or something? I, I didn't do it last year. There was supposed to be someone from the forums who came that did it last year, but she, she never made it. Yeah. There, my friends that have done it, and several have, it's $30 to $45, depending on if you want the advanced or the, the minimum package. And I think that has to do with how much they promote you or how much free stuff you get. But then I know the one that just did it last month, she had to order four or five different ones. And she luckily did it before she released it because even though she thought on the screen her formatting was right, it was all screwed up when she got the actual print copy in the mail. So she went through like five rounds that she did have to pay for before it looked good in print, before she okayed it. So if you do go that route, make sure that you order a copy yourself and look at it before you approve it for launch. And I, like I said, I don't do mine in print just because for me it's not cost effective. My target audience is all E. And, um, you know, I just haven't seen the, the need to, you know, do both. One more uh, quick question, and then I'll sure. stop my in the group. But no, you're <laughs> fine. Go ahead. One of our other um, sponsors too for the the Nano this this year was Avon Publishing. Yep, that's who I used to work for, Harper Collins. They want to do um, their own e business right. called Avon Impulse, mm -hmm. and they're looking for all of our submissions by December 10th. So I'm going crazy trying to edit what sure. I just in 30 days, which is almost impossible. But do you know anything about? that company and, and their uh, procedures. Avon is HarperCollins, owned by Rupert Murdoch, and Fox News and News Corp, and phone hacking. And uh, <laughs> that's all related. And wow. yes, that's who the, that was the big six publisher I used to work for. So the returns policies, um, I had to sign a, a yeah, uh, you know, basically a promise to shut my mouth for three or four years after I left there. So my three or four years haven't expired. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, 
me personally, I would never give them any of my business. But that's just, you know, that's because I've seen the other side. And I'm sure that, you know, all, all the big six are going to go with e-publishing. And they're all going to start e-publishing imprints because they're losing too much money on the other end. So they're all going to start it. Simon & Schuster just bought out, what, Author House. And Author House is running packages for $500 to $2,000 to uh, do their self-publishing imprint, which is ridiculous. That's more of a vanity press than, you know, just a, a you know, an e-publishing division. So, you know, by all means, you have to try things and, you know, you're not going to know if it's right for you unless, you know, you try it for yourself. But me personally, I would never sign with one of them. And the other thing is, what are their royalty percentages? Because I heard they were still going to do only 7 to 14%, as high as 25% for bestsellers. Well, with this new division, the Impulse, what they want to do, it's all e-publishing through Avon. It's a new thing you're trying to do. Right. There's no, there's no upfront. You just get 25%. Yeah, 25%. And then, yep, and then after you sell, I think it was 10,000, you get 50%. Right. So here's the deal. You start out on Amazon, Nook, which is Barnes and Nobles, Kobo, Sony, Apple, Diesel, and Smashwords, all of which you can upload yourself. You start at 35 to 40% on a 99 cent book. On a 2.99 book, you're making $2 on each of those platforms for every sale. In the meantime, if you go with Avon, you're stuck at 25%. That's the difference. Losing a lot of money. <laughs> That's a lot of it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And you also have to look at the fine print to see are they going to confine you to certain genres and are they going to have first right refusal on everything that you write. So those are things to consider too because they're not going to want to brand you and build you and then lose you. So you have to be careful that they're not tying you into stuff. And what about um, your subsidiary rights? Let's say that you sign that deal with Avon, your book takes off, and you get a TV or movie deal. Now, how much of that is Avon going to get? Do they own all of your rights or just your e-rights? So that's really important when you look at your contract because today it's a multimedia world, right? So, like, for example, for me, I now have audiobooks. I own those 100% as well. If I had a traditionally pub contract, they would have rights on those too. So those are something in a multimedia world that are very important. You want to make sure whatever you sign, you're only signing the e-rights, you're only signing the paper rights, you're only signing one right at a time. You don't want to give that away. So that's another thing to look at. Uh, so have you ever have you ever been to Smashwords? No. Oh, I I went there in researching some e-publishing stuff. Uh, to Mark Coker. Like, yeah, it seems like a really solid um, a solid company, I guess. Air quotes. They have about thirteen employees now. I think they're growing so fast that I'm sure Mark will add some soon. Um, but they do a hell of a business, and I'll tell you what's so important about them. Um, their reporting stuff kind of stinks. They need to upgrade that, but I think it's just right now they're just so overwhelmed. But here's the deal. You can upload directly to Amazon through KDP. Have you heard of KDP, their Kindle Direct Publishing? So you can upload directly to Amazon. You can upload directly to Barnes & Nobles through Pubit is their self-publishing platform. You can upload directly to Kobo now. They have one called Kobo Writing Life. You can upload directly to Smashwords. Smashwords will then send your books to Sony, which no longer, they don't have their own self-publishing platform. Apple, they do have a self-publishing, but it's only if you have a Mac. If you don't run on a Mac, you have to go through Smashwords to get there. Um, Diesel, though, and libraries. All of the libraries are now hooked up to Smashwords, and that's going to be a huge, 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 huge new platform for us. So all of those things you can do yourself and make between, like I said, the 30% and the 75 to 80% a book. Yep. Wow. I actually learned about Smashwords through the, the 
the, the NILA conference that I went to a couple of weeks ago, uh, the National, or the New York the Library, Library Association. Yeah. Uh huh. And because um, there were a lot of, I mean, there were a lot of traditional book jobbers there sure. that are trying to sell things, but there were just as many e-publishing people, and they, you know, they told me to go that route. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that they told me is that they. A lot of them hate ebooks like a lot mm -hmm. because it's really, really, really hard to control um, DRMs right. with ebooks. Right. And they, digital they, rights they, management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, digital rights management, and they think that that um, m many of them feel that we, we are in the twilight of the ebook era. Mm -hmm. That they are that they are going to be going the way of the dodo. Wouldn't they soon. like that? Who told the tradie pubs are saying that, right? And they're popular authors, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wouldn't they love that if that was the case? Let me and, tell you that, I, go ahead. I know a lot of librarians who feel the same, that that, e, that, um, that they don't like e-books, they don't want e-books in their library, and they don't think that e-books are a very viable marketing resource. Mm -hmm. I, Obviously, you disagree. Can you, uh, can you expound well, on that I'll a little bit? Well, I'll tell you the reason. I disagree from firsthand experience. I just was asked to speak at the Indiana Library Association, and my husband and I were amazed that the libraries are so open to ebooks. In fact, they have been arguing and arguing and arguing with the traditional publishers for going on six years to try to come up with some sort of a format and a, and a place, a store that they could one stop shop for all ebooks. Amazon will soon be opening up to libraries, they're committed to that as well. All of my books are non-DRM. I use no DRM. And here's why. I want people to share my books. When I get a notice on Google that I've been pirated, thank God, because that means that I'm in demand all over the world. I want people to be able to read my books. The people who are pirating will never pay for a book never pay for a book and they're always going to be smarter than us technolo technologically speaking and they're always going to be able to find it and download it somehow. That's why they're hackers, that's why they're geniuses, they're going to get the books. But if they're getting your book it's because it's in demand and that's that can only be good in this, in this kind of a world where everything's multimedia. So to me the, the downside, if you have DRM, is the people that really will use your book for the right reason. They'll read it, love it, share it with somebody. They can't do that and transfer it amongst different readers and from their computer to their phone to their, um, you know, to their tablet. They can't do that if you put the DRM on there. So you want to leave that off. And libraries are loving, loving, loving ebooks, and they're having more and more patrons who want ebooks, and they're finding ways to do it. So I think that's going to be a huge, huge. And I just, like I said, I just spoke with that group at Valpo University with their big conference here. When was that, honey? In April, April or May? And uh, it was just incredible the enthusiasm they had for it. I'll tell you a great site to read on all this stuff too is Digital Book World. They have some terrific articles. In fact, they just wrote a, somebody did a thing on the librarians and how angry they were that that was the perception with the tradie pubs that they didn't want the ebooks. They've been wanting the ebooks forever. And I'll give you an example. HarperCollins, for example, and Avon, they have what they call limited licenses. So for a library, they can only use an ebook so many times before they have to buy another copy which is ridiculous. And that's what's preventing a lot of the Avon and HarperCollins authors from being able to do good business in libraries because who wants to keep buying copies of a file that's perfectly fine? That's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's yeah. Just, Simon just and ridiculous. Schuster did that for a while, Penguin did it, and now I think HarperCollins is the only one left doing that. Yeah, it's 20, the year of 26 loans. One yeah, system loan it is. Yeah. Duh, I forgot you guys are in a library. Yeah. Oh, you know that, don't you? Yeah, well, well just, yeah, so um, I know, and it's, pro it's prohibitive because it, it actually, it hurts everyone because mm -hmm. I think the librarians are resistant to then purchase that book, if that's the case, right. because um, the pricing is really high to begin with. For and that's the other thing. It's like 27 bucks, I think, for the new Janet Ivanovich, the librarians were telling me. 
And when I told them they could get mine for free, the first one, and 99 cents, they were just, they couldn't believe it. And I said, I can give you thousands and thousands of more just for my WG2E site at the same price. They couldn't believe it. What other kinds of questions do you have? Ask me anything. Good question so far, by the way. What do you think that um, part of your success has had to do with, you know, the fact that you're writing in series? Do you think that's a big, a big part of it? I think that helps a lot. And I'll tell you the other thing I've done is I call it cross pollination. So what I've done is I started out writing my boot scootin books were romantic comedies. Well, my favorite characters from those, my fans told me, were these mom squad freaks of nature that uh, are these blue haired Charlie's Angels. So what I did was, is I wanted to start writing humorous mysteries, but I took the mom squad with me. So everybody that loved the mom squad and the boot scootin' books romantic comedy went right over that little genre jump with me into humorous mystery. Then I decided I wanted to do Castle and Beckett Gone Country. Still with a humorous mystery twist, but, you know, now they're in small town, hokey poke, Indiana, instead of in New York City. And they're dealing with stiffs and barnyards instead of, you know, in an alley somewhere. So now I took the mom squad with me there. Well, then I decided I love a good witch story. And I love the good witch. So now the mom squad, Grams, has decided she really wants to be a witch. So now she's going to appear in my new paranormal series, too, as a wannabe witch. So that's what you do. You get those readers hooked on that character that's so strong you want to blog about them. And then mm -hmm. you take that character across all your genres. And that's what brings your fans with you. And they get so excited. That's the, that's the other thing about the e-publishing world, too, is that your readers are up for anything. Readers, because they have more choices than they've ever had before, are reading more choices and more genres than they've ever read before because it's right there in front of them. It's great prices, one click. They'll try anything. So what I was going to say is your first book is free. You get people invested in the characters in that book, and you carry them over to your second one that's for a fee, and they'll buy yep. it because I know what's happening to those characters. There you go. And then you create these box sets where they can tell their friends, hey, I love Dee Dee Scott, but hey, you can get all of them in order for $2.99. So then you get them hooked by box set on your new readers, and then you keep your old fans going with all the new series, and then you box those so they can tell their new people, and that's how it works. I call them sneezers. I'm a huge Seth Godin fan. For the Purple Cow, if you want a great book on how to build your brand and market yourself, read Seth Godin's Purple Cow Marketing. And Seth talks about sneezers. And what that means is you want people to sneeze about you. Just like if you were this bad virus that just won't go away, but in this case it's a positive thing, you want people talking about you and your books. Okay, like when you guys go home tonight or you talk to your next group of writer friends, hey, you know, I just talked to Dee Dee Scott or whatever, and she, this girl had some great ideas or whatever, that's sneezing. And that's that kind of momentum that you want to build. What else? I think we might be, I think we might be good at okay. this point. All right. Well, thank well, you all so much. Good luck to you. Happy holidays. Thank you thank so you much, holidays. and happy thank holidays you so to you. It was come great join to talk us on the WG2E and ask a lot more questions. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks Lucy. Good night. Bye.